So hi everyone, um, I'm Izzy Cleary. I'm the Head of Fundraising and Engagement at Population Matters. We're a small campaigning charity uh, campaigning about population, obviously. So that intersects with environment and women's rights. Um, you can obviously find out more on our website. I've been in this role and working with Civi CRM for about three years. Um, I've previously used the Razor's Edge and Thank You in other charities. So we work with third sector design, two of the people there are on this call now. So welcome to Becca and Michael. Um, and over the past few years, we've ironed out a lot of teething problems we had with our kind of initial setup of Civi. We've added some new functions to the website and some more kind of user and donor experience integration. So that's included a website refresh, some new fundraising pages, and also more recently a move from Drupal to WordPress. On top of that kind of external facing stuff, we've done so much internal facing work around how we manage donor relationships and look at memberships as well. So I'll talk about some of that as we go along. Um, so here's what I'm going to cover today, but it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. When I started putting this together, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about and then it kind of all amalgamated into one big thing. So hopefully this makes sense to you. I'm going to look at some of the basics and some other cool features that we've added along the way. Um, some areas overlap, but hopefully the order will give you an idea of how we're using Civi for fundraising, relationship management and engaging with our supporters. So within our setup, I'm going to talk about the main user and website integration. Then we'll look at how Civi can support comms, how we segment data, how we're using it to help support relationship management and then some other additional elements that we've bolted onto the day to day. So I'm just going to bring up this list of all the things I think I'm going to cover within that. Um, so as you can see, there's quite a lot there. Not all I will mention in detail. Um, and obviously, we can come back for questions at the end. Having seen that a number of you work on memberships, I've realized I don't actually focus on that much here. So we can certainly come back to that with questions at the end. So let's go. And I'm just going to take a drink before I start. Is there a few comments on your slides or not? They're not going forward. Sorry, say that again? If you were advan advancing your slides, that you were, were still on the top page. Oh, I was. The, 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 the screen is shared with the one with your uh, speaker notes rather than the actual presentation, if that helps in any shape or form. Really, not really. I don't know how to rectify that right now. Um, I'm going to end the slideshow and then start again. So let me just... See, this is working with two screens and it's not effective. Um, window. Is that better? Yep, that's much better. Thank you. Okay, great. So let me. Can you still see it? Yeah? Yep, we can see that fine. Yeah. Great. So now you can see the content list. Yep, that's working. Fabulous. Okay, so back to what I said before of my kind of list of um, extra things that we're going to cover within that short summary. Um, there's a lot there, but we can come back to questions at the end. And obviously, not all of this I'll go through in detail. So, as I mentioned, we have a WordPress website, and that's kind of uh, WordPress linked to Civi CRM. And then these are just three screenshots of three main interactions that users can have with our website. So the first one is the mailing list. That's kind of our bread and butter, particularly as a campaigning charity. So the more people we can get to take that first step and make it onto Civi with a contact record, the better. I'll talk about how we use groups for the newsletter later. But in terms of the user experience, um, you know, you've just got first name, last name, email, really simple. And then the kind of um, privacy policy sign up check at the bottom. So. In the UK, we're still under the GDPR regulations, which is the data protection law in the EU. Uh, so that covers that off. So then the other options we have are to make a donation. So that's a one-off uh, gift towards our work, or then you've got the membership. So both of those have these really nice widgets um, and you can choose particularly with the membership if you want to make a monthly or annual donation and the amount. Um, we have two levels of membership, which I'll come on to later. So once the user has been through this process, they move on to a themed Civi page um, with a profile and form to add in all their details and payment information. So that looks a bit like this. So you can see that URL at the top is where you go to next in terms of, oh, sorry, going ahead of myself there, where you go to in Civi from the website. 
So you can see from that URL that I selected to make a donation of £100 and it was a one-off donation. So on the screenshot on the left, you can see kind of the form that would appear for the user. And because I'm logged in, you can see the form has pre-filled some of my details. And we do have another function that's possible to enable existing donors to pre-fill their information too, which I'll mention later. But for now, what I wanted to show you was the configuration for the contribution page. So that's the middle screenshot you can see there. So for this particular donation, we're limiting it to card payments via Stripe. And for a one-off donation, the recurring option is not selected. But of course, we would use that function for our memberships. We also limit our contribution pages by different financial types that really help us account for donations correctly and create different searches and reports. So the financial type for this one is just donation, but we have others set up for membership and for specific cash appeals. And we use grants for income from trusts and foundations and a separate financial type for legacies, which is from gifts and wills. Now on the kind of forward on the right screenshot, um, you can see we're using different profiles so we can say which form elements we want to show the user. So in this case, it's pretty simple. It's the main details, which is their name and address. And then at the bottom, we include the gift aid form, which again is a UK tax based um, giving platform. So people can add their details there. So in addition to that, we're using communication preferences to be able to include the option to sign up to our newsletter while they're making a donation. So one thing that's really great for Population Matters is we get a lot of donors coming and donating direct on their first visit to our website because we're quite unique in what we do. So we don't want to lose the opportunity for them to also sign up to our newsletter. So we've got that function in there so they can sign up to the newsletter at the same time. Obviously, once someone's given a gift, we want to say thank you. So for that, we're using scheduled reminders. So no matter which contribution page we're using, um, we set them up here. There's just a list of a few of them um, on the left-hand side. So for the example we've just seen, you can use the thank you donate, and that's linked to two contribution pages, actually, the 8 billion and counting page and the donation page. So that's triggered when an action occurs related to that page. And we use that for empowered plan appeals as well. So each schedule reminder is personalized to the action taken. So we have a separate thank you for empower to plan, which is our crowdfunding campaign. Um, so all those templates are different, so they're really personalised depending on what project the donor has chosen to support. So you can see at the bottom right there just a tiny snippet of one of our email templates, which is what I'm going to show you next. So our communications, in summary, there's a lot of them. So first of all, we use Mosaico templates, which is a popular extension for all our donor communications from Civi. So this screenshot shows you the user interface for setting up that mailing. So you can see you can change the blocks, the content and the style. And then more on the right hand side, it's actually the email content that we've used. Um, this example is from our Christmas match funding appeal, which was a mass mailing, but we also use the templates for our one-to-one -one com communications. So that saves us a lot of time and also enables our communications to look consistent and professional. So we can send those one to one to people, for example, confirming they've updated their email address or something like that. So key things about Mosaico templates for fundraising and kind of the really important stewardship that we do is using those tokens like contact email greeting to make sure each email is personalized to the person. And then we also use checksum links, which I'll come on into a moment. But I just wanted to draw your attention also here to the unsubscribe link at the top of the email. So that's related to communication preferences and again, GDPR. And also, I'm sure either Becca or Michael will be able to talk about this later, but you might notice top left of the screenshot that in the background, I found this template through using Form Builder. So previously it used to be a nightmare to try and find all, all our templates, but we now have this really nice um, search function that we can find our templates more easily. So. If anyone's got any questions about that later, I'm sure they can be answered. So checksums, as I mentioned, really, really useful. Um, it enables us to pre-fill donation forms with personalized data for people. So it helps ensure we don't get unnecessary duplicates for existing contacts when they're making new actions. But it also means we're saving supporters time when they've interacted with us before. They can you know, go straight to a form and find their addresses already pre-filled. They don't need to do it again. 
So the hyperlink is embedded in the donate button and it looks like the link at the top. So the start of the hyperlink is the appeal page. In this case, it's one of our Empower to Plan projects. And then everything from the question mark onwards is the link that Civi uses to identify the record. So we used to use this functionality for linking to communication preferences as well. But since the move to WordPress, we're now using the Aform token, which is the URL link at the bottom. Now, I can honestly say I've forgotten why we do this. So again, if you want to ask Becca or Michael at the end why we switched to that functionality, you can, but it effectively does the same thing. It recognizes the person who's received the email and links up to their record in the database. So on the right hand side is a screenshot of our communication preferences. And we updated those last year. Um, it's kind of a, a nicer way for people to decide what they want to hear from us and they can easily unsubscribe. So all the options for people are listed um, and whether they can receive things by email or post. And this is also aligned to other detail on people's records. So for example, you'll see in this list that I have the option to receive the Population Matters magazine and that's because I'm a member. But if you're not a member and you don't have that benefit, you wouldn't even see that as an option. So it's a really nice customizable communication preferences page. So I'm gonna talk about groups later, but effectively when people unsubscribe from these mailing lists, they unsubscribe from groups in Civi. But I just wanted to show you very quickly in terms of mailings, what we're doing for some A-B testing, which might be something that you'd be interested in doing. So, the left-hand screenshot is kind of the basic uh, mailings in Civi you might be familiar with. And then obviously we're testing different subject lines in this case. So we do this for our general monthly update as well as for fundraising appeals, just to try and increase the open rate. So we can try multiple different subject lines for different groups and see what works best. So in mailings, we also have the choice of using different from addresses. So this one is just our generic supporters app, but if I wanted to make it look like it came from me as an individual, then we could choose that. Our recipients are always based on groups, as you probably know. Um, I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background. I'm going to apologize for that in case you can. Um, in this case, we are excluding Empower to Plan donors because this email was to raise funds for one of those projects. And I didn't want to bombard people who've already funded it with another ask. So it's a really nice segmenting technique to exclude people there. And then you can change the sliders at the bottom in terms of the test mailing. So I chose to send this to 20% of that list for the A and 20% for the B, which made the final mailing the 60% left. And the system does that for you. It's entirely automated. So you don't have to worry about who's received it and who hasn't. So you can see on the right hand side um, is the third line down. Um, it's about 30% open rate for both emails. Actually, the one on the left was slightly better. So that's the email that I chose as the final mailing. Which overall, actually, they're all pretty similar. Um, but it's still good to test. Obviously, there's different examples where um, those percentage open rates might be different. So segmenting, here we go onto groups. So groups and particularly smart groups are really the bedrock of all our fundraising and relationship management because it enables us to segment different groups and manage their communications and the relationships we have with people. So going right back to the newsletter sign up on our website, as an example, the groups contacts are automatically added to are updates and projects and appeals. So we made this decision back again when we were doing some work on the communication preferences. So we make it really clear on sign up that they'll receive the monthly update and additional emails, but we split it out into two groups behind the scenes. So people do ultimately have the option to unsubscribe from our fundraising asks if they want to. So this means that the recipient group I choose for fundraising appeals is always the project and appeals rather than updates, which is used for our monthly emails. Now you can see numbers wise, there isn't a big difference. Uh, it's about 600 people or so, um, but it's really important to kind of honor that decision that people have made. So breaking down those groups further, you can see we divide those up into our members and our non-members, who we call our supporters. So we have slightly different demographics for those audiences, and it also enables us to do further A-B testing to those different segments. It also means in our general monthly update, we can include an ask to join as a member for those who are not already, 
and choose a different ask for people who are already members. So signing a petition or making an additional donation. You'll notice in these lists, I hope you can see them well, um, that for each pair of groups, so the members and the non-members, we exclude its opposite in that email. So if we're sending the same email to both groups in one day, there might be an occasion where we have a duplicate in the system that has a membership or doesn't have a membership. So we want to kind of mitigate against them receiving the email twice. That's just a really nice addition to do that. Beyond mailing groups, we use groups a lot for internal fundraising purposes and segment our members even further. So as I mentioned, we have two levels of membership, Standard and Catalyst. Catalyst just pay more per month or annually. Um, so there's times we might only want to send the communication to those higher paying members. So the group requirements look a bit convoluted here. Um, and thanks to Becca for setting those up. You can see her name there. Um, but we wanted to ensure that if people are paying the correct amount for them to be eligible for a certain communication, then we're including them in that group no matter how they're paying. So we have some people who pay by cheque or payroll giving or a standing order, and they're not automated in CIVI. So we really wanted to make sure that you know those um, financial thresholds were included rather than just using a contribution page as the search criteria. And obviously, you know, the top one, the Catalyst members, there's also the manually added options. So there may be situations where there's an individual who we want to receive a communication or be treated in such a way that we might just want to manually add them. So the second screenshot there, the major donor group, um, this identifies people who've contributed at least £5,000 in a single sum or £10,000 over time. So that's kind of um, an easy way for me to identify our, our big hitters in fundraising effectively. And then the third little screenshot on the left, I'm not sure it's technically best practice to make a smart group of smart groups, but that's what we do to group together our VIPs effectively. So we've got our Catalyst members, our major donors, and our board members and patrons all together in a group so they can receive kind of our top level of communications. We also use groups for other areas of fundraising. So if I just talk you through the bottom right, um, this is just a screenshot from someone's record. So at the top, you can see they receive the magazine by post. They're also in a temporary group for me to do something with. It's got my initials on the end. And then we've got current members, Catalyst members. This chap's very um, generous. So he's also a life member a bit further down. Because he's in the Catalyst members group, he also receives the behind the scenes email and he also receives the annual report by post. So there's a range of ways you can use groups to segment people for mailing lists or other reasons that you might be communicating with them, or even just as placeholders to group people together. It can be really useful. So relationship management, really key for fundraising. Um, and obviously there's a lot more you can do, but here's just some of the ways that we track how we're working with people and also kind of the internal facing side of it. So the basis of any good fundraising is understanding a donor or prospect's relationship to us. So we use the contract record extensively. Um, I think most of the modules that you see on the left-hand side are ones that we use um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But one of the cool things that I think is really helpful is the contact layout editor, which is an extension. Um, we wanted to customize what information different users could see. So we have three different levels of access. The basic layout is for our less tech savvy users. Um, so there's a few people in our organization who might just want to quickly look up an address and not be confused or bogged down by the other information that's available. So people who have access to basic layout literally just see the top line information about contact details and that kind of thing. Then we have advanced and super, practically the same. The only difference for super is that those people can see wealth notes. So again, this was a consideration in terms of GDPR compliance and not sharing sensitive information too widely. That said, we do have and use tags for memberships and other important information. So they act as really quick flags to other users that in this example, this person's a Catalyst member and a high net worth individual. But because of what I said in terms of the layout, those wealth notes, their banding and the note that goes alongside them, they just wouldn't see. But equally, we need the 
everyone in the organization to know that they're an important person and to treat them in such a way um, with their kind of their wealth and commitment to us. So you can see the list of the main ones we use on the right hand side there. So including our patrons and trustees. Um, if you take a phone call from someone and you need to quickly understand what their relationship is with us, then it's right there in front at the start of the record. We also have different tags for things like themes that we do. So if people are interested in uh, women's rights or climate change or biodiversity, those are tagged. And we've also started using it for our external stakeholders. So just other people and organizations we communicate with, we have their type logged. So they might be a funder, they might be a government body or another NGO. Now activities are really key. I couldn't live or do my job without activities. Um, they kind of explain everything to do with the relationship and the chronology and how a person's interaction with us has evolved and you know most recent communications that kind of thing so in a lot of cases our supporters will just have a very long list of bulk emails which is what is logged when they receive a mass mailing so one top tip i have is to exclude bulk emails or whatever it is in your system that is most logged so you can see the wood for the trees it's really difficult to see you know a specific email sent four years ago if there's four years worth of bulk emails in that list. So in this example on screen, um, let's work from the bottom up. So you can see this person received a mass email, uh, which is the end of 2022. Um, they then received an email that was a thank you and they received in the post and then that was logged as letter sent. There was a phone call involved as part of that exchange. There's more bulk emails then an email was sent about our biodiversity projects and there's a scheduled phone call to follow up with that donor on that activity. So it's really a one stop shop for kind of the relationship and the history of our conversations, basically. So we also use the scheduled activities to ping a task to another staff member and we're using CIVI rules extension in some places. So as one example, offline donations that receive um, checks in the post, for example, there's a rule set up so that I receive an email to notify me that that contribution requires a thank you because it's not automated as it would be if they donated online. So how do we keep track of all that? And as Becca knows, this is one thing that really excited me when we implemented this probably this time last year. So this is a screenshot kind of trying to hide the detail so it, it doesn't look as it does for my screen but these are dashlets on my home screen that kind of inform my to-do list um, it's really helpful to remind me of tasks that I've got coming up or I can check um, what outstanding tasks are assigned to colleagues and really follow up with things far in the future you know for example a grant report I can use that to tell me that in six months time I need to send a donor a grant report so these are created using search kit and there's a wide selection here, but the overdue and upcoming activities are kind of my bread and butter and the my contacts divided into individuals and organizations. So kind of the difference between individual donors and trusts and foundations basically. And they're formed based on a relationship type where I'm listed as the primary lead. So they're effectively my portfolio of donors and then other members of the team have the same thing. Um, and then the one with more detail is basically generic activities to anyone um, I might have a scheduled activity assigned just so those little bits and pieces I can make sure I'm picking up um, that colleagues might have assigned or just remembering to send an email, for example. So finally, I just wanted to show you a couple of kind of more in-depth engagement things that we've been doing and some of the latest work. So annual surveys really bring together most of what I've just spoken about really. Um, and they're a really key part of our engagement with our members and supporters. So we have a members and supporters version of this survey, partly because they have different demographics, but it also enables us to ask the kind of, would you consider becoming a member question to those who aren't? So when a user fills out the form online, we use the A form token in the email to announce it so it connects to their existing record. All the information about their response is added in an activity. And each question is set up as custom data, which is then accessible in the advanced search so we can quickly and easily segment on the results. For example, the screenshot here, I can quickly find all the people who've said they're interested in leaving a legacy to Population Matters and then use a Mosaico template to email them that information they've said they'd like to receive. 
So we also have a search kit set up to list all the results in the background so we can export and analyze all the responses as a whole, which we always use for our annual reports. And personal campaign pages are the latest thing. Um, they're effectively an in-house version of Just Giving. So this is a new area of fundraising for us that we're proactively formalizing. And it's a really good way for us, particularly as a campaigning charity, to raise awareness as well as income. So from a link on our website, people can now sign up for a user account and create their fundraising page, just like you would on Just Giving or similar. Um, so there's a totalizer and the sharing option, just like other platforms. And there's more functionality we want to add in in future. So we want to be able to list donors with an option to be anonymous and have a blog section for the fundraiser to update donors on their progress. Now, all those individual personal campaign pages are linked to the same contribution page in the back end and they have their own financial types so we can track and report on contributions being made to those pages. So we'll be able to track, you know, are these making a difference? Are we getting significant income? How many pages are being set up per year? All that kind of thing. So again, like I said, for donations, we're using the update profile in addition to the donation form. So when people who are new to Population Matters land on one of these fundraising pages, they have the option to sign up to our newsletter in one fell swoop and kind of be added to the mailing list as well. So what next? Um, we're in a really strong position with all this working together. Um, it has taken some time. Um, I've been working with Civi and Third Sector Dime for three years now, and it has been a long process, but we're, we're really getting there, tightening everything up, and it's all talking to each other as we'd like to. But the next things we're looking at are installing the Chasse extension to look at um, donor and supporter journeys, basically. So what happens when people sign up to the newsletter, they currently receive a welcome to the newsletter email, but nothing beyond that. So we want to really improve that journey for people. And then we're also looking at having a function so people can order our campaign materials. So um, again, on the kind of fundraising versus awareness raising side of things, that will really add an extra element. So similarly to the dashlets, you know, when someone orders the materials, then actually they'll go to Anthony, who's on this call. He'll have a little dashlet and it will say, Joe Bloggs wants to receive five leaflets about Sir David Attenborough, and he'll be able to send them on. So watch this space, and hopefully we can fill you in on those developments later. Um, but that's all from me, apart from any questions, and thank you for listening. Hey, thank you, Izzy. That, that was really fascinating insight into how you're using Civi CRM. Um, I've shared the link in the chat um, to a document where people can add their questions. Um, okay. We've already got quite a few questions in there. Um, cool. So shall I read out the first couple of those and then you can see if you can answer them? Yeah, sure. And if I can't, I'm sure someone else here will. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the first question was about Mosaico templates. So asking mm -hmm. if that's a separate extension from the main Mosaico mailings. Um, I want to say no, but someone please confirm. I'm, I'm going to say yes, it is. Oh. There is a there is a separate extension that allows you to use any Mosaic code template in a Civi CRM system message. So you can then use it as a scheduled reminder <laughs> or in the standard, you know, mailing templates, one off ones. It's a separate extension. Thank you, Becca. And there's a, the next question was about donation page. So how do you get the link to pre-fill the donation amount? Ah, so it doesn't pre-fill the amount. So the way we have it set up is the link will go to where the donation widget is. And at that point, you select the amount. And then when you move on to the form, that's where the kind of address information will be. So there's kind of a middle step in there that doesn't necessarily pre-fill the amount. But I'm sure you could probably do that in some way. Um, if you wanted, for example, to make sure people gave £10, for example, um, you could, oh, you could even set up your contribution page, I suppose, to only allow contributions of £10. That would be another way to do it. And Craig, you've got your hand up. Is there something you wanted to specifically respond to on those points? Craig, did you want to? Speak. 
Oh, maybe not. Okay, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, so, it's, does changing the email address in the newsletter, um, uh, does changing who the news the email address is from, cause it to end up in spam folders? Not to my knowledge. And actually, the really cool thing you can do with it is make it look like it's coming from a person, but maintain the generic email address. So we have two options. We can send supporters at Population Matters emails from Population Matters, or we can send them from Robin Maynard, who is our director. So you can make it look like it's from someone different by using renaming it, basically. You name it something different, but include the same email address. OK, great. Roshni, you've raised your hand. Did you have a specific point on that? No, maybe people are clicking on the raise hand button by mistake. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question about A-B testing. No and question. What, what, oh. Sorry. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself. Let me lower ah, my hand. Okay. <laughs> Did I lower my hand or raise my hand? Different. OK, uh, now I'm lowering it. Um, the question I had was regarding your email list and the groups. So one of the challenges is that when people select bulk email opt out, um, and I don't know how you deal with the unsubscribe because unsubscribe um, and opt out are slightly different in Civi. And um, what we do is just do opt out because otherwise, let's say if they get added to another group based on who they are, mm -hmm. they still might receive an email even though they unsubscribe from that specific group. Um, so how do you deal with the unsubscribed opt out issue? And then even when someone does opt out, they're still in that group. So do you manually remove people who are bulk opt out or how does that work? I think there's a couple of things there. And actually, Becca, can I defer to you on that? Of course you can. Um, you. Roshani, we've actually done um, a lot of custom work with Population Matters on the communications management. So the page, the communication preference page, um, Izzy has shown, is a bespoke. So every time someone would hit the unsubscribe, they are being directed to that page. Um, there are the main groups people can be in, they would unsubscribe from. So whether they're, let's call it the main newsletter, in which case in the back end, we are automatically also removing them from those groups and recording an activity that that person has carried out that action. And at the same time, we are also have the flag for um, unsubscribe me from all bulk emails and a little disclaimer at the end that says, you may still receive emails about your membership, you know, the transactional ones. Um, so it is customized, but it works really well. Um, and it records the activity, it removes people from the group. That's great. Yeah. Can I, can I just add one tiny thing to that? Of course you can. This is my call, uh, here. We will, that, so that, that's a, that custom extension we, that's a custom extension we wrote for population matters, but, um, uh, we are planning on releasing it as a kind of a, a, a kind of t more publicly. We're just implementing it for an, another organization at the minute. But the idea is that, you know, as as Becca said, rather than unsubscribing you from a, any particular group, but any unsubscribes are directed to a kind of a, a page where you can manage all of your groups. So that which and that kind of generic idea we think is kind of useful for um, lots of organizations, but then the specific implementation is obviously um, custom to each uh, client. But yeah, if you're interested in that, then we have, I'd be happy to share that um, uh, that code. Thank, thank you so much. The other thing to note about the mosaic or templates and that unsubscribe in the pre-header um, is that that adds it to our subject line. So we've actually had to code add some HTML code so that doesn't actually appear in the pre-header in the subject line. Have you run into that issue? Uh, so we run into that issue in some cl email clients. Obviously, I've never actually seen it, but I know what you're referring to. But you can add pre-header text 
that does then come before the unsubscribe. I don't know if you've seen that in the, the kind of pre-header block, you can add in extra text. So you shouldn't need to be going into the HTML, I don't think. Yeah, it was still causing some issues. That's why mm -hmm. we're setting it up in the HTML code, but I will test it out a little bit more. Thank mm -hmm. you. Cool. Great, thanks for that. I also meant to say, um, please feel free to turn on your video. If you're happy, the recording's still on. But if you're happy to be part of the recording, then you may show your faces when you're asking questions. Um, so shall I go on to the next one, which is about A-B testing and what the delay was between the test and the final, final mailing? So you have complete control of that. Um, so while it's testing, you can sort of go, okay, it's been going for an hour, it's done 50% of them, I'm pretty sure option A is going to be the winner and, and select the final one and send it. Or you can obviously wait to the end. So it entirely depends on how long it takes for the mailing to be sent out, depending on the size of your group. Um, but yeah, you have complete control of when that final one goes. That's the one bit of it that's not automatic, I suppose. Great, thank you for that. So the next was more of a comment, so so <laughs> impressive. What, what level of um, skills and uh, resourcing, staff skills and resourcing is needed to get to this amazing level of leveraging CIVI CRM? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, as I said, it's been a long road to get it to this point. Um, and we've done a lot of work behind the scenes that you kind of haven't seen here as well. Um, and lots of credit to Third Sector Design who totally supported most of this. We've been on a bit of journey with staffing and resources. So Population Matters generally has been professionalizing over the past five years or so. And when I came in post, I was the first full time fundraiser, despite us being around for about 30 years. So when I came on board, we also had a kind of head of finance who was looking after the database. Uh, but that was kind of moved into my role at that point as well. We had some part time support to do some tidy up jobs effectively. So a bit of data cleansing. And then that turned into a permanent part time role. And then that individual sadly moved on. So it's been a full time permanent role in our organization since August last year uh, with the job type, title of CRM and engagement officer. So um, Rob is our kind of main guy who looks after CRM for us and works very closely with third sector design on a lot of the imp implementation, a lot of the testing. So we do have someone kind of as part of the team to do that. But obviously we're a small charity, but the website and the database is just so integral to what we do. We couldn't you know, campaign, everything's digital now, everything's online. Without this as a resource and this setup, we basically wouldn't exist as we are. So for us, it's a really clear investment to make. Um, but obviously, smaller charities might not be able to make that commitment to it. Um, in addition to obviously having a consultant on board to do some of the newer stuff as well. Great, thank you. So there's a question about checksum. So someone's a fan of that, um, <laughs> but they have con security concerns about it. So just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, so this is what I was referring to earlier with, um, I love checksums too, I think they're great. And when we moved to WordPress, we moved on to A forms, I think for that reason. Not quite. Well, partly. Not quite like, well, so there's two things. So we also use the um, no override extension. So I understand the security concern is if you send a an email out with a checksum, someone forwards this to a mate, um, Izzy sends me, forwards me an email, oh, you want to have a look at that? I follow the checksum and I could ultimately override Izzy's details with my details. So we use the, a no override extension. And we, 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 it never happened because it does make it pretty clear. It sort of says, you know, you, you cannot change your first name or last name. At that point, people look at the bit that says, if this is not you, click here. Um, so that has always helped. We've moved to the A form token because we are because the, the majority of the forms we have been using are now form builder forms. And the nice thing with that is that it coats the token and it's not visible. With the checksum, you see the visible, you know, contact ID and people can't change it, but it scrambles it and ultimately when you then follow it it unscrambles it without actually exposing it to the user. I'm pretty sure that it, William or Michael will correct me if I'm wrong on this logic, but that is why we're moving to A form and the tokens for those where we can. 
Yeah, I, I think just to add to that. Yeah, Are you it's... here? <laughs> right. Yeah. <I> couldn't... <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, that that's true, and also it's more much more secure than the A form. Uh, sorry, it's just the checksum. That's what. That's why we whole uh, CVCM and the team moving towards it. So that's why it's uh, more secure, and that's why we move. Just another side thing. Great. Okay. So the next question was, are you exposing um, the CIVI CRM paths or URLs um, or hiding everything under WordPress front end pages using Form Builder and other tools? No. So the URLs are available. So as soon as you move from a widget to the donation form, for example, um, you'll note in the URL that it's a CIVI CRM path. I didn't actually know you could hide them. So maybe that's something we can look into because actually that's one of the things in terms of the personal campaign pages, those are obviously CIVI pages as well. So when people are sharing their page links with their friends and family to support their fundraiser, it's pretty ugly, to be honest. Um, it's not a really nice, snazzy, um, you know, Michael's fundraiser URL. It is the CIVI and the user ID and the page ID. So um, that might be something that we look into. Yeah, I can I can quickly speak to that as well um we definitely try we definitely try to use nice wordpress friendly urls wherever wherever we can um at this at the, it's not always easy and so like so the the places where we haven't been able to like contribution pages we've used um uh we've used the kind of the normal civi crm url but there's there's work um or there's a lot of work we'd like to do on improving the way that um civi crm and, and wordpress integrate particularly with regard to kind of using um, uh, Gutenberg in WordPress. And once we've kind of progressed that, then it'll be a lot easier to just kind of embed CIVI CRM pages like contribution pages and personal campaign pages in friendlier WordPress URLs. So I think there's a follow up to that question, which are what are your method preferences for making CIVI data available on the WordPress front end? I'm not sure I know what that question means, I'm afraid. Can whoever wrote that question explain? Feel free to unmute yourself. Sure. Uh, no, it's just basically, you know, I assume you're using the form and form builder to do so. And, but I was wondering if you had, if there were specific if you preferred form builder, if you had other mechanisms that you were using to present the data in a viewable form or for interaction of editing the backend data. I don't think we have any. I, feel, I mean, I can, I can answer if you like. Yeah, please go ahead, Michael. <laughs> I mean, we, we've used a bit of, we've used, you know, for, so we've used a few different, we've used search kits, we've used some uh, Gutenberg kind of custom Gutenberg components uh, or blocks, and we've used normal contribution pages. It's kind of like, it's a bit of a mix of everything. I think it's kind of, it, there's a bit of pragmatism, I think, involved in thinking, well, actually, in this circumstance, just in the native contribution page is better, or this this time we can use a form builder form or a search kit display, or, so I don't think there's one perfect solution for everything. It just kind of depends on what, what we're trying to achieve and what the, the best tool available in Civi at the time is. It's kind of always evolving. May I add to that? That may help. So one of the things we are we have done is, for example, the anyone that starts a personal campaign page or may eventually want to order campaign materials, we, we have a WordPress page that is their dashboard. That's a mixture of really nicely themed search kit results bringing in rather than the core, you know, these are your personal campaign pages. So it's a nicer style one. We're limiting the options, but we've also added the extra action saying, oh, do you want to start another page or, you know, and then, and then linking to whatever form, other form we may need them to go to. And that's all on, at the moment, all on one dashboard pretty much driven by search kit and form builder. Okay, so the next question is, why did you move from Drupal to WordPress? I believe it's because the next available 
Drupal version was going to be the last, if I'm correct. So we the kind of the move to WordPress was going to be inevitable. So before we moved up to the next level of Drupal, um, we made the switch to WordPress. Can I do it quickly, jump in? Yeah, well? I mean, yeah. please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's bro broadly correct. I, I, the way I would the way I would put it is also like, so there are there is a newer version of, of Drupal that we could have moved to, but kind of migrating to that would have been just as hard as migrating yeah. to, to WordPress. And I, and I think ultimately um, WordPress seems to like, we would, we, going back uh maybe three or four years we were definitely kind of a drupal um favored drupal but these days i think anything you can do this is a totally subjective opinion and people will disagree with me but um anything that we need to do we can do it in wordpress and we kind of feel like the kind of wordpress is a much easier and more kind of user-friendly tool for most people to use and it allows us to do everything we need to do and the kind of the gutenberg content editor is really great as well so they're the kind of they're the reasons uh, certainly they're the reasons that we we've moved as an organization that's doing CVCM to wordpress and that's what we recommended for population matters yep and we take their advice as we do on a lot of things it's very good advice <laughs> great thank you were there any other questions from anyone no but if not, um, I will turn the recording off and we can um, continue on with a more informal chat and a few updates about CVCRM.